just as quick um, introductions uh, for everyone here. My name is Chris. I manage the customer success team at Uncircle. You did not sign up for this to hear me talk. Um, and above me here is Ken Larson. Um, and I think everyone knows Ken. Ken, feel free to give yourself a information, but one of the biggest subject matter experts on structural drying, on restoration. Um, I think this might be the 10th webinar Ken has done with us and we always get uh, fantastic feedback. So Ken, thanks so much for joining us today and we really look forward to uh, getting into it. Well, thank you for having me here. I'm looking forward to these. These are always fun. I never know what I'm going to get, but uh, they're always uh, an interesting challenge. Ken, I am going to pull open the uh, questions here. And by all means, uh, at any point here, you're more than welcome to pick any that you think are super important that you want to uh, to get to is what do you do with personal belongings sitting on a wet floor? What do you do with furniture sitting on a wet carpet? <laughs> well, I think uh, that is something that um, many of us are quite familiar with. Uh, you've got to protect both the structure and the contents, right? So we tend to isolate them from the wet surfaces. And uh, of course, blocks and pads, these are uh, methods that, of course, we would use to, you know, you put the furniture on blocks and pads in order to protect both the structure and the contents. Now, I think that the question might be associated with what do you do with the contents if they can no longer be left in the affected area? Where do you put them? That might be, I think, what the question really was. And that's always a challenge. Sometimes it requires a pack out. And if you're gonna pack out contents from a structure, you really need to have a comprehensive inventory of what you took out of that structure. Because the minute you start handling it and taking out of the, out of the structure, the owners of the, the contents will start to notice blemishes and say, oh, you damaged it in the process of your handling. So it's not, um, it's not a minor subject. The subject of contents and responsible handling and care and tracking of these contents during a mitigation effort requires good documentation. The, 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 um, the mitigation team is typically, their mindset is let's get in there and provide value and start restoring the structure. Let's do what it takes and get the process of drying uh, going as, as quickly as possible. But if you, are moving the contents and don't document the condition and location and, and item description properly, there could be consequences down the road that you uh, um, you know you didn't handle it uh, responsibly. Uh, hopefully that's a sufficient question or answer to the question. I will say this though, I believe it's section 17 of the standard, I'm 16 or 17, it's towards the end of the blue pages. Um, there is an entire section just on contents. And so there is a, a, a significant amount of language on what to do with contents that are affected in a, a water damage chamber. And I would encourage you to uh, review that with your team if you're encountering contents uh, that is interfering with your drying strategy. Awesome. And I know one of the things that we've talked about, I think you discussed this in a previous webinar as well, that people want to keep in mind is, even if you're manipulating contents and leaving them on site, if you have to move them to another area of the building, there's still a lot of benefit in that documentation process, even if they're not going to go back to your shop, right? So um, anytime you're manipulating contents, having that documentation could be so important. People are so precarious about their stuff, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. contents uh, is becoming more of a specialty and a respected specialty. There are people that are really getting a, a good reputation on knowing exactly how to identify these contents as well as how to uh, Pack them, preserve them, and protect them. Absolutely. Um, one of the questions uh, that we got here, um, and I'm trying to word into question, how do I provide real information, real-time information for escalations if needed? I want to confirm the scope of work and make sure I bill accordingly for all the work completed. So it sounds like if you run into something you didn't initially scope, how do you provide that escalation to whoever you uh, need to? Oh, my goodness. And, and isn't that the truth, right? Our, our industry is... If, if you give a, a, a price or an idea of the scope of work on day one and we encounter surprises like we always do, the change in scope and ultimately the price of the work is going to have to uh, change as well. So the way that I encourage contractors to document that process is this way. Uh, so I'll give you an example. In California, 
it is a law that you must give a price on um, at the time that the consumer is signing your agreement. So you have to have an estimate in there. So how does a person do that before they've taken anything apart? They don't know what the you know where the the water went entirely. They're they're about to discover, uh, you know, um, complications in the process. I mean that's just we all encounter that. So the way to get around that is that you provide the price associated with a very defined um, scope of work. So for the price that you quoted, you will provide this many days of drying equipment and the drying equipment will consist of two extra large dehumidifiers and six air movers and whatever other equipment that you're gonna have and up to 20 hours labor and three service calls and five uh, daily inspections. And the uh, at the end of the job, it will be this much money. And then you have a language in the agreement that says, any deviations or additions to this uh, anticipated scope of work shall incur a, a, cha a, a change order and additional cost. And that's fair. You said what you're going to do for what price, and then you would say that if there's going to be more work, you have to have change orders agreed and signed by the con uh, the the policyholder, the paying party. Yeah, that's the way I makes, would do it. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, one of the uh, questions that we got here uh, that I thought was interesting we haven't heard before: uh, Do you have any tips for drying in sub-zero temperatures? Um, you are obviously have a Canadian background. I don't know if you've experienced that before. Um, what would you say to our contractors that need to dry in less than ideal conditions? Uh, well, so, so it's not funny that we, we, uh, as a Canadian, I remember that feeling. Oh, we're in a cold Canada. Well, I tell you what, if you think it's tough to dry in a cold Canadian environment, try and, and dry something down in Houston, Texas or Miami, Florida, uh, it's not uncommon where outside it's, um, for those of you who understand grains per pound, and I'm pretty sure everybody here does. Um, here in uh, Florida, it's not uncommon. You'll have 160, 170, 180 grains per pound outside. Now, when you open the door, that humidity just floods into that house and it's constantly trying to get into the house. That's a difficult drying chamber. It might be hot, but it is brutally tough to dry things in it in, a humid uh, outdoor environment. So let's get to Canadian conditions here. Can it, Canada has typically very cold, very dry environments. It's not uncommon in the wintertime in uh, let's say Alberta or Winnipeg or you know Ontario, Quebec. In the wintertime, yeah, you can have um, less than five grains per pound outside. So you have unlimited quantities of dry air outside. The temptation is to take the low grain, dry, cold air from Canada, outside in Canada, and just heat it up, heat it up and dump it into the house. I will tell you that that strategy frequently fails. And I will tell you why. You, um, it's, This is a psychrometric statement that I'm about to say and hopefully you'll understand it. If you wanna write it down for future consideration so you can wrap your head around this, um, you might wanna do this. So here it comes. The Even though it's very dry outside, low grains per pound, and it's cold, even if you heat it up and you dump it into that structure, it's really important that you produce a condition inside the chamber, the drying chamber, that has a lower dew point temperature of the air than the coldest surface in that building. Now you have to think about that. So you want to produce an atmospheric condition that has a lower dew point temperature than the coldest surface you can find anywhere inside that building. Now understand outside, it's going to make the exterior of that building very cold. Inside it might be nice and warm, but the, the cold materials can condense water and that's what you have to defeat. So here's what Canada needs to start getting more used to this idea. A low grain refrigerant dehumidifier will never produce a condition in the drying chamber that has single digit grains per pound. If you feed it double digit grains per pound, it'll never get to single digit. You can't work. 
It's just, it's a mechanical limit to refrigerant dehumidification. So what you need to start getting used to that, the idea of, of proposing to your paying party is that you need a desiccant to produce air that is got a lower dew point temperature than the coldest temperature of a material you can find in that building. So you go around with your laser thermometer and you see what the temperatures are of the coldest surfaces you can find. And if it is, let's say the temperature of the material is, I gotta think Celsius now, it's minus 10 Celsius. That's the temperature of the exterior sheathing. Well, then you have to have a dew point temperature of air inside that building that is less than minus 10 Fahrenheit. That's very, very dry air. So you might have to supplement your dry air that you have heated up from outside with some desiccant air as well. Now, if you have a somebody who's disputing that, I invite you to get me on the phone with them and let's have a three-way conversation because it's a psychrometric truth. It's easily um, proven with a chart. Uh, it just takes someone knowledgeable to take them through the process. So there's a real need for desiccant technology in cold environments. And I invite you to start exploring the use, the responsible use of desiccant technology in your drying chambers when you live in very cold conditions like Alaska or Canada or any of the northern states. It gets just as cold in you know, Nebraska and Wyoming and you know, Montana as it does in Canada. And that technology is ap applicable in those states as well in the wintertime. If you have any other additional questions on that subject, we can explore that further. Put it in the uh, the questions, please. Let's let's take that one down the road a bit. Good question, okay, guys. There there was some uh, other questions, so please feel free to go them in the chat. Um, Ken, I'm just kind of curious when you mentioned the responsible use of a desiccant. It sounds like there's things that we need to consider that you wouldn't need to consider with a refrigerant desiccant. Um, how, what what would be your kind of quick tips for starting to use a desiccant? So I think that was an innocent mistake. There's no such thing as a refrigerant des desiccant, okay? As a refrigerant dehumidifier. I think that's what you meant to say, okay? Correct, so, yep. Uh, all right, so yes, a refrigerant dehumidifier has limitations in how dry it can make the air. A desiccant's general truth is that whatever air you put into a desiccant comes out drier on the other side. It hasn't got those limitations of, of uh, dew point temperatures. So, um, uh, yeah, if you have any other questions on the use of desiccants, we can explore that. When I did say the responsible use of desiccant technology, uh, that's a very broad subject. And there's many ways in which you can inappropriately deploy a desiccant dehumidifier. Um, I'll give you some examples of, of reasons that I have heard people say they want to use a desiccant that I cannot endorse. I cannot get behind these comments. Here's an example. I installed a desiccant dehumidifier because it was cold in the building. Listen, if it's cold in the building, go get a heater. You don't need a desiccant, you need a heater, all right? And that's way cheaper than a desiccant. A desiccant is an unbelievably inefficient heater. For the price you pay for a desiccant, it's a very inefficient heater. It does not produce significant BTU for per dollar, if that makes sense. Um, and you know, heat is very easy to deliver and produce and provide. I'd suggest that you get heaters if you need heat. Here's another one, a, a poor use of a desiccant. Um, uh, let's see now, I used a desiccant because um, oh, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, I tell you what, if any of you have a question on that, uh, an adjuster said they they denied your desiccant charges because they they said that they didn't like your reason. Propose it here in the in the question, and we'll explore it together. Okay. We do have kind of one related here, Ken, um, in, in the the chat uh, regarding desiccants. Can would you use them on a class four loss instead of a refrigerant dehumidifier? Is there a use case for that? Yeah. So class four. Um, is difficult to dry uh, uh, densely, uh, dense materials that have become deeply saturated, like a concrete slab or uh, dirt crawl space that has turned into muck. You know, that, those are examples of uh, uh, difficult to dry specialty drying uh, processes. 
So yes, they can be uh, useful on, um, on uh, class four losses, but I want to caution this group. The reason why is, remember I said that desiccants, whatever air goes into a desiccant comes out drier. You can make air so ridiculously dry that it will produce a dry skin around the wet material. Thus, and we know that when things dry, they get they shrink, so they become tighter. Now, if that skin around a board, for instance, becomes very dry, it can trap the water inside the wood. This is not just a Ken Larsonism. This is a real thing. Check out any wood book. Research the subject of case hardening, C-A-S-E, case hardening. And that is a, a phenomenon that happens on anything that's hygroscopic. As a reminder, anything that's hygroscopic is a substance that can change, uh, that can react to changes in humidity. That's a hygroscopic substance. So wood is an example. You put a piece of wet wood in an extremely dry chamber, the first thing that's gonna dry is the exterior of the wood. That's gonna shrink the wood. And the water that's in the core cannot escape through the wood and it slows the process down. Now, we restorers tend to just kind of like, don't say that, we just wanna get that money for you know the drying, the specialty drying. But the fact is that it requires responsible deployment. I will remind everybody, I don't know of very many kilns for kiln drying wood that uses desiccants. Now you would think that if they could really speed up the drying of wood with the use of desiccant technology, they would do it because time is money. They don't do it because it slows the process down because they, it's too aggressive. If you look at a wood kiln drying schedule, seriously, these are the numbers they work with. 150 Fahrenheit to start at 70 or 80% relative humidity. That's how they dry wood. You have a super humid environment so that the skin around the wood remains moist and the water can transfer out of the wood through that moist uh, 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 fiber uh, surrounding the wood. And then as it progressively dries, you raise the temperature to 160 Fahrenheit and you lo lower the relative humidity just a bit. So it goes from you know 80% RH down to 70 and then the next day down to 60 and then down to 50 and then down to 40. But it's a, it's a schedule. It, it starts out cool at 150 degrees Fahrenheit and goes up to about 180 Fahrenheit and then down to about 40% RH. And that's how, you are, how they dry wood because that results in the fastest product, the fastest rate of drying. I don't know why we haven't explored this understanding more thoroughly in the restoration industry. I think that this could um, dramatically change the our success rate and the rate at which we uh, dry materials. The, the place where I see this idea falling apart the most, where you dry too quickly, is in a dirt crawl space, in a cold atmosphere. So you've got a dirt crawl space uh, below a house, the first thing that the uh, the contractors I've encountered do is they go get a whole bunch of air movers, get heaters and get a desiccant and they blast it with heat, make it desert dry and have a ton of, of air movement going down there. And what ends up happening is you get this, this uh, skin, this cake of dried soil that when you put your hands on the dried soil, it cracks through the crust into the goo below the crust. And that's what happens to wood. It happens to uh, uh, dirt crawl spaces. You're too aggressive. So what I suggest is I want to breeze. I just want to breeze in that, that crawl space, not 70 miles an hour. I want maybe five miles an hour. So how fast is that? Well, this is what five miles an hour looks like. Okay, I got some paper. This is five miles an hour. If you, if you don't believe me, go get a little anemometer. It's a wind speed gauge and see what five miles an hour looks like. That's what I want in that dirt crawl space and over the wood. When the water's trapped inside, this is all I want. Don't you give me 20 or 30 miles an hour. It'll slow the process down. I want this speed. 
And then I want to have um, air that is reasonably dry, but not desert dry. In my perfect world, a conventional refrigerant to start and you end with an LGR. That's how you start and, and end the process. Desiccants, uh, you, you can over shrink things, you'll get uh, uneven drying patterns and sometimes it uh, creates that skin. So I, I don't like starting a job with a wood drying job with desiccants. And then finally, um, uh, let's see. Oh yes, uh, the heat temperatures, I, the temperatures I want in that dirt crawl space, approximately 70 to 80 Fahrenheit. Uh, 20 to 26 Celsius. That's sufficient for me. Um, and you'll get your best results. Now, the contractors I've given that advice to call me back and say, couldn't believe it. Dried it so fast, I couldn't believe it. It just fixed it. So please experiment with that. If you don't believe what I'm saying is true, I don't mind that. Please just try it and make your own determination. I have found tremendous success with cooling your jets don't throw everything you got at these class four jobs. Remember how materials re, re, um, re, release their moisture. It's a slow process and it's controlled. It's not just let's throw everything we got at the at the warehouse at this. Thank you for that long winded reply. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> oh, no, where I think there was a, a ton of good information there. Um, we are going to pull the string a little bit more of this cold drying question. So we got a few more come in. Uh, Caleb asked, would you be able to help? Uh, heat up the outer sheeting to help create a higher dew point so you could still use an LGR dehumidifier? Well, that's an interesting question. Oh, could you repeat that more slowly? There was a lot of thoughts there. No worries. Can you also heat up the outer, he said sheeting, maybe sheathing, to sheeting. help create a higher dew point so you can still use an LGR dehumidifier? So heating up the sheathing does not change the dew point temperature of the air. When we're talking about dew point temperature, we're talking about a condition of the air, not a condition of the material. So you can't heat up the material and change the dew point temperature. It doesn't work that way. My question to you, whoever asked that question, how do you heat up the sheathing when it's on the outside of the, the building between the siding or the brick then you have the, you know, the Tyvek wrap and then you have the sheathing and then you have your studs and insulation. Um, how do you heat up that sheathing from inside the structure? Uh, I'm open to explore your creative thought process on that, but it's gonna be difficult to do that. Yes, if you heat up the sheathing, it will not condense water. I'm with you on that, but how do you do it? And I'm not sure how you can efficiently accomplish that objective, but good, good thought process. Uh, Matthew asked, would the wood EMC chart also be able to prove the capabilities of a desiccant? Yes, yes. And that was a very uh, wise comment. So for those of you who are not familiar, the, US, um, the USDA, U, uh, Department of Agriculture, has a National Forest uh, Products Division. And they, in their laboratories, created a very complicated uh, a mathematical formula that will predict that if you take a piece of wood and place it into an atmospheric condition that has a known temperature and relative humidity, and it is unchanging, in other words, it's gonna stay that temperature and RH, you can predict what the eventual moisture content in that piece of wood will become. It's a very, useful mathematical formula. Now, while that formula is specific to the moisture content by weight of the wood, the principle applies to all hygroscopic materials. So if I can say that I produced an environmental condition that would have produced an EMC, equilibrium moisture content value, in the wood of 4%, and the dry standard is 8%, then I have produced a responsible drying condition that would pull the moisture out of the material to the point where it, I had hit my desired drying target, and then I stopped the drying process. And that, that is a, a powerful um, and effective tool that can be used to justify 
why your drawing strategy was as aggressive as it was. Okay, now just understand that the Wood EMC formula is not specific to gypsum wallboard. It, it's a different, it, it's, it's not associated with that. It's only wood products or plaster or concrete or anything else that's hygroscopic. It is only a wood measure only, but the scale, the scale is useful on all hygroscopic materials, if that made sense. And I will also remind this group, <laughs> if you look carefully at that EMC chart, it has nothing to do with grains per pound, nothing. We are taught to give so much attention to grains per pound but it has nothing to do with the eventual moisture content of the materials we are drying. The materials that we are drying respond to changes in relative humidity, not in changes to grains per pound. And, and that might be a, an adjustment to some people's understanding. Relative humidity is not irrelevant. It is extraordinarily relevant because that's what dictates the eventual dryness of materials. Yeah. It's an interesting thought process. Uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit here. And you guys feel free to keep the questions coming and get some really good engagement here. Um, we had a question beforehand, again, that said, can I run ozone generators safely in townhomes and apartments? I'm always concerned for the joining neighbors that ozone can go into their unit. Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. I see the last uh, question in the chat here. Is he saying hydro or hygro? Let's do a real quick summary of which one I'm, I'm referring to there, okay? I am saying hygro with a G as in gas, okay? Let's just, I want to understand the difference between the two. Hydro with a D as in David is liquid water, like a hydroelectric dam that uses liquid water to spin the turbines, right? Turbines. And then um, the high grow with a G is also H2O. It is water, but when water is in a gas phase. So when I'm talking about humidity or when we talk about humidity, we speak about high grow with a G, hygroscopic measures. Okay, that's a good question. It's a good one. Good reminder for everybody. Let's talk about ozone in an apartment building. My first question will be why? Why do you want to put ozone on a water damage loss? And I'm open to, there, there's, there's a multitude of responses I've heard on that one. But here's what I will say. Your concerns over the uh, potential health consequences if people are exposed to your gas phase radical oxygen species like ozone or hydroxyls, all right? I know you said ozone and it was specific to ozone, but I'm inviting hydroxyls into the same discussion because it is a radical oxygen species and it is not specific to what it will surrender its oxygen to, what it will oxidize. It's not specific. It'll oxidize darn near everything it comes into contact with. And if you are having your employees or customers or the public consume radical oxygen species that are inhaled. I, I, I'm distinguishing between medical application of ozone uh, in uh, health treatments and random ozone that is being ingested through the uh, respiratory system, which is what we are producing. There is, There are applicable uh, medical uses for these uh, radical oxygen species in medicine. But that doesn't mean that you can just start throwing it everywhere and let people start breathing that. Um, so I'm going to ask the question again, why do you think ozone would be a good idea on a water damage loss? And I'm really seeking to have that question narrowed down because I think that deserves an answer. Here's my concern. This the S500 and the S520, the water and the mold standards, they're, they're quite emphatic about uh, how efforts to um, contain or kill or encapsulate microbial organisms is never an adequate substitute to its physical removal. 
So if you have a need for ozone in a water damage loss, my question to you is why did you find the need to put it there? If it was contaminated, you're supposed to physically remove the contaminant, not try and hide it with an ozone attempt. Um, so is there anything that you got for uh, more detail on why you would like to introduce a radical oxygen species in your drying strategy? I'm interested in your, your uh, feedback on that. If you want to throw feedback there in the, the Q&A, uh, by all means, feel free. Um, we had a few questions here uh, from one uh, person that, I, that was fantastic. I appreciate submitting three questions. Um, the first one, um, Ken, in your expert opinion, can we expect any upcoming revisions to the way categories of water are classified? And what is your opinion on the current configuration? Yeah, so we're talking water category, the degree of contamination of the water. This really is one of my, uh, oh, it's a sore point for me because I'm so disappointed um, <clears throat> that, you know, the mitigation industry has been around for, you know, 60 years or so now. And um, this is still uh, a subject that is left kind of nebulous. We really don't have thresholds that this is a category one, this is a category two, and this is a category three. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. It appears that what we're doing is that, you know, we're, uh, we're having our technicians who have no understanding of uh, microbial risk or toxicology or uh, biology or any of that. We have very little understanding and we're telling them to go and make the determination how disgusting is this water? <laughs> How are they supposed to know? By looking at it? It comes down to opinions. And, and, and when there's an opinion war, nobody wins. It's just an opinion war. And we need to have more compelling and conclusive data. So here's what I would like to say about this. I've got so much to say on this. It's a, a, I'm very passionate about this subject. And here's why. This one sentence. Billions of dollars every year hinge on the correct determination of category. Billions. And nobody's collecting data to establish what category it is. Billions. You want to have an argument? Let's argue how dirty the water was. And man, that's an easy one to argue if you don't have any data to um, back up your opinion. And I will also say, for the love of God, Will you stop your guys from saying the water came from a freshwater line, therefore it's category one? No. If it comes into contact with contaminants, it's no longer a one. It's just not. And so then the question is, how dirty does it have to become in order for it to become you know, two or three? And that's where I believe the, the responsible strategy to determine category is to walk in on the job and try to establish that it's category one water. And you test to make sure it's category one. And there are, and the reason why I'm saying that, you look for one, not category two and three, you look to prove it's a one. Because if you can't prove it's a category one, then it must be something else. Now, category one is defined by every city in Canada and the United States and probably Australia too. That category one, the drinking water that comes out of your, your supply lines at your house, there are probably, pub, well, there usually are published thresholds on how much E. coli can be coming out of that drinking tap and still be considered uh, suitable to come out of your drink of your, your faucet. Now, if you can't prove that, you know, it's not, uh, that it is still category one, then it's not. It's significantly contaminated. So the first test I ever do, I test the water coming out of the tap. I pull swabs. This is what this, and then I, I start testing it for E. coli. Here's how much E. coli came out of the tap on the day that I got to the job. Oh, the number is zero. Then I went and checked the, the puddle that was sitting on the, you know, under the kitchen sink because the, the sink faucet leaked for some reason. There's a puddle. I go and pull a sample of that. And I check that for E. coli. And if I get a whole bunch of E. coli that's present in that water, is it still category one? Well, obviously not. It's significantly contaminated. Therefore, I have proven what category one looks like, 
and proven that the water in the house is no longer that clean. Therefore, it's significant. And so then the insurer will say, or the, the, the third party consultant or administrator, they'll say, oh, well, don't you dare call it category three. It's a category two. I'll agree to category two. And then you say, you win. It's a category two. I'm not even going to argue that it's a three. And they go, great, thanks. And you say, now let's go to section 12.3 of the standard and see what the, the uh, recommendations are for category two. And by golly, both category two and category three, it's in the same section, same heading. Category twos and threes are handled the same way. The same way. So let them have it a, be a two. I don't care. It's the same protocol. And uh, the, the concerns are just as, as significant. Now, here's what I think you're going to find. It, you're probably going to find the same results I did, that the real um, unicorn in mitigation work are category one losses. That's the unicorn. That's the one you rarely see, if ever. I, I've done hundreds, no, thousands of inspections to determine category with testing. And I have found less than 1% of the jobs that contractors encounter are category ones. So when we go to and send our technicians to IICRC schools, and we talk about all this in-place drying strategy and save this and save that, yeah, you can save it on category ones. That's one in a hundred jobs. One in a hundred, you can do that. We're supposed to be tearing that contaminated material out. Yes, you don't, you, I said, I'm not yes. No, you don't save absorbed category two sheetrock. If the category two water splashed on the surface, but didn't absorb into it, no problem, go wipe it off. You can save that piece of sheetrock. But if it absorbed into that sheetrock, it is not a candidate for restoration because you can't clean it. Same with ins insulation. Same with cavities under ceramic floor tile. If you've got water that went under cavities in a ceramic floor tile and it's determined to be category two or three water, you must access the cavity so that you can conduct the decontamination. But you got to prove that there's a cavity there first and, and prove that it's contaminated water. Then you make the recommendation for the physical removal of the ceramic floor tile so that you can access the contamination thoroughly clean and uh, sanitize the area and test it to make sure that it's sanitary before you start putting the materials back in place. I'm sorry, I think I'm kind of rambling, but I'm very passionate about this subject. It's an important one. No worries. We kind of had two very similar questions um, kind of as follow-up to this, Ken, would be um, essentially, how do I quickly test the water? Do I have to, can I test it myself? Do I have to send it to a lab? And how does that hold up to insurance scrutiny? Yeah, and this is always a problem. So uh, I'm an independent third party that conducts these tests. And I will tell you that as a restorer, you're between a rock and a hard place because just like on a mold job, if you collected your own mold samples, everybody's gonna lose your, their mind because you're conflicted. You had no right to collect those samples. You you stand to gain financially by, by saying that it, the mold is present and that you can say that you're done by saying, hey, I got rid of all the mold. You're conflicted to collect those samples. And the same is true on water category. So here in Florida, what many contractors are doing and the way I get my leads uh, to conduct these uh, inspections is that the uh, contractor is generally sick and tired of arguing water category with these third party armchair quarterbacks after the job is done, trying to figure out, you know, what the category was after the job is done six months ago. You know what I mean? That That's such a difficult uh, uh, conversation to have and they're sick of it. So what they do is they go to their prospect customer and say, Mrs. Jones, thank you for signing our agreement. Now, in order for us to know the correct scope of work so that we can uh, repair your structure uh, responsibly and competently and only do what's absolutely necessary, we need to have uh, someone establish how dirty the water was. Because if it was really dirty and absorbed into materials, we have to replace those items. So that's what we need to do next. Mrs. Jones, I'm conflicted if I collect those samples and the insurance company will likely uh, will likely reject my findings with my testing. 
So what I encourage you to do, Mrs. Jones, is to call one of these three qualified indoor environmental professionals. And just for what it's worth, it's going to be hard for you to find those. These are not mold guys. They are not mold inspectors. Mold inspectors don't have a freaking clue how to test for water category. They have no training on it. They have no understanding of it, generally speaking. Um, so determining water category needs to be done by someone who can do it quickly, understands your trade, your trade. Okay, they got to understand restoration and uh, have some uh, understanding of, of what the risks are associated in building science and how buildings are assembled. That's what you're looking for to identify a good IEP. And you, you let the Mrs. Jones make a decision from those three. And then you make sure that the consultant, the IEP, engages with the policyholder. Never you. Don't let them work for you. And the reason why that always fails is because the adjuster always says the same thing. Every time I've done this, it's always the same answer. The adjuster says, didn't you get your WRT? Didn't you get your ASD, your water restoration technician? Didn't you get trained by IICRC? Didn't you learn about water category? Yes. Well, then you've been trained on how to categorize. So I'm not going to pay. If you don't know how to categorize the water, then I'm not going to pay for you to hire a third party to do your job. And, and you sit there and go like, really? That's the way you're going to handle this, Mr. Adjuster? And, and it, they shut it down. However, if the policyholder presents my paid receipt to the insurance carrier and says, I didn't trust my contractor's determination of water category because he's obviously conflicted. I hired a qualified third party to conduct these tests and produce a protocol that would be typical for the, the correct uh, category that was determined. And then um, let them uh, you know, present that invoice to the insurance carrier and let them reimburse the policyholder for the legitimate expense. If the adjuster says, oh, we don't pay for that, then the, the simple answer is, please show me the exclusion in the policy. I have never seen the use of experts to establish the correct scope of work ever being denied as a legitimate expense on a covered peril. I've never seen it. I'm not saying it can't happen. I'm just saying I've never seen it happen. Awesome. Yeah, any other questions about water categorization, feel free to have them coming in. I know we have some kind of newer businesses um, on the call from the, the questions that we've got. Again, some people that might be opening up their restoration business um, for the first time. We did have a few questions about that. First one would be, how much training should you provide your average water tech prior to sending them in the field and expect them to feel empowered and confident in their decision making? The three-day WRT, should they be taking an ASD course? What's your recommendations uh, for kind of that minimum level of training before you'd send them out? Well, so, so the answer to this question might disappoint some, okay? <laughs> and I've been in the business now for 46 years now. What you're about to hear is my opinion, and that's all it is, okay? Um, but I want to start by explaining or... Re recounting a conversation that I had in a group of instructors, well-respected IICRC instructors about 30 years ago, and the, the, maybe 20 years ago, 20, 25 years ago it was, right at the beginning of the ASD class. The question was presented to us instructors. When a student successfully passes their water restoration technician course and they now have that credential what are they qualified to do what a great question right and then the next question was when a student has their asd what are they qualified to do when they have their commercial drying specialist what are they qualified to do it's a really good question and a great exercise especially when you're starting to create a course so that you have the end in mind what is the student going to be qualified to do after they success, successfully complete that course. And here's what the consensus was among this group of about 10 instructors. So this is not an IICRC statement. It's not an RIA statement. It's just the way we instructors have spoken of this subject in the past. Here it is. 
a WRT student is qualified to be a good helper. He's a helper. Don't you dare send him out on a job alone. He doesn't know enough. Okay? He's a great helper. He's qualified to follow directions from the crew leader uh, and have sufficient understanding to know what he's talking about. But they are not qualified to create a competent protocol and drying strategy. They don't have the background or experience to do that or understanding to do that. All right. Then the ASD student, what are they qualified to do? They're a good crew leader. Okay. So it, remember, you have to have your WRT in order to attend the ASD class. So they've got experience in the, as a water restoration technician. Now they're getting applied structural drying more. Now they're going to be a crew leader. And then the commercial drying specialist class has very little to do with being a technician. The commercial drying specialist class is focused on being a good project manager. All right. So if you can remember those three uh, job titles with each course, WRT is a helper, ASD is a crew chief uh, for residential, and commercial drying specialist is more of a project manager course. And then, okay. And then I also want to say this. I can't stop there. When you have, when your guys have that, and let's say they get, they're triple masters at the IICRC. They're a master textile restorer, a master fire and smoke restorer, and a master water. And they sit there and go, see, I got them all. I am done. I would invite you to say, no, you've got high school done. You've done high school. Now you got to go to college or university. Then you start focusing on RIA, advanced credentials, the water loss specialist, the fire and smoke uh, uh uh, sorry, the fire loss specialist, my bad, the contents loss specialist, the environmental risk specialist, and the um, certified restorer is the capstone. That's as far as you can go. That's as, that's the end, is CR, uh, as far as credentials go. I don't know of any other title that can take you farther down the, um, the uh, mitigation or restoration rabbit hole. Um, but don't think that IICRC is the end. That's just high school. Now you got to go get your advanced education on the subject, and that's RIA. Okay, so I'd leave that with you. Um, let's say tomorrow, Ken, you open up Ken's restoration. Uh, one of the questions we had was, what was the what would be the first thing you would teach your technicians? Oh, so, assuming they have basic credentials, what would be day one? All right. So this is. I'm, I don't claim to be a marketing guru, okay? So that's not my my strength. I'm I'm Mr. Science Guy. That's all I am. But as far as marketing goes, when I had my own business for 20 years, one of the, the big light bulb moments that I had that I found great success with was a conversation that I had with my team where I, I changed their view of what they did for a living. So I asked the group, what... Do you think when you're telling your friends what you do for a living, what do you say to them? And they come up with all kinds of uh, expressions like, I am a mitigation contractor. I'm a restorative drying specialist. I do water damage. And then we explore how we don't do water damage. We do water re you know, repairs from water damage. Um, you know, Just have it lighthearted, but make them explore what they are calling or what they are coming to work thinking that their job is. Now, here's what I did that changed everything for my business. My business literally grew. It doubled in size in one year when I, after I had this conversation. I, um, I explained to them that what I really want them to do is to make my customers a cheerleader. I don't care how you do it, but for the love of God, make them so excited with the experience that we are delivering that they will tell all their friends and family and and uh, about how great the experience was and how um uh how much they enjoyed working with us there's so many things that fixes it fixes the arguments i have with adjusters about what we did on the job it fixes my marketing challenges it figure it fixes my um word of mouth uh uh, conversations that are happening in my community. It changes my guy's disposition 
they come to work realizing that they're not just there to carry air movers and give me blood, sweat, and tears. They're there to make friends of my customers. I did, I went to great lengths with this. I told my guys, if any of our, our the customers that we send you to, if they call me down the road and say, hey, could you do me a favor and send Derek, Derek McCoy, that guy that came last time, I sure liked him. If they remembered your name, I bought you lunch that day. I will buy you lunch if they remember your name. And so, you know, it just got them excited about the fact that they are there to create relationships. I had a rule in my company. If we're not behind the eight ball, you know, and, and really struggling for time that day, and they say, would you like a coffee? You say yes. I, I want you to say yes, and I want you to sit at that table and take 10 or 15 minutes and have a conversation and make them into a friend. It's the best investment I will ever make if I can get the homeowner to love my team. And, and my business, it changed. The, it, everything in the, the way that the company ran was a more positive and more um, exciting uh, uh, objective throughout the day. And uh, I would invite you to explore that idea. It's a very difficult thing to keep your chin up when no matter what you, who, you, everybody you talk to for some reason is mad at you, all right? It's a very difficult atmosphere to, to stay chin up, but um, it, it's very important that you do that, that you try and keep the, the mood upbeat because this really is a very difficult industry to be in when you're on 24 seven call and everybody for some reason is complaining about what you're doing. And um, it, you kind of just want to go, oh, enough of this and give up. But what we do is so important. It's so important. Imagine how hard it would be if our industry wasn't present, if, we, if there were no restorers left. What would the public do after fires and waters and vehicle impacts and things like that? It, it would be a horrible existence. So we do provide a valuable, important uh, service and we have to keep our uh, spirits high and not let it get us down when people think that we're all opportunists. Absolutely. And I can think of some of our, some of our customers um, and some of their best reviews are, you know, on the worst day of my life, right? You know, you never know when these events are going to hit, right? This person was, this technician that showed up, you know, was what got my life back together, right? So it's such an opportunity to um, to, to make those lasting friendships. Um, on the same new business um, thread, um, we are agnostic here. Ken, do you have any opinions? What does someone need hardware wise to start a business? What equipment do you recommend? What moisture meters? What would you recommend um, personally? Okay, so that the answer is on that, it depends. Okay, it's a good question and an important one. So here's what I will say. If you're gonna do commercial work, big losses, don't cut corners on the value of your moisture meters and um, and thermal hygrometers, actually all of your testing devices. If you're gonna do commercial work, you better get the best. Because if I see one more contractor walk in on a, a big commercial job with one of those little green thermo, thermal hygrometers that you put in your, your pen pocket, you know, those little tiny skinny ones that cost, I think $89. If you're doing commercial jobs with that junk, that you're gonna get beat up like mercilessly on the review because they just don't give you the accuracy required to do large commercial uh, work with uh, uh, high performance machines like desiccants. So you definitely wanna go with thermal hygrometers like Visala, Tramex, uh, uh, you know, Protimeter has good meters uh, for moisture meters. I don't know if I would use those on, um, uh, on desiccant uh, jobs because they, they, I find that when you start getting into really dry conditions, their accuracy is not sufficient. So I recommend Visala, V as in Victor, A-I-S-A-L-A. -A -A. Visala, they're, I think it's Swedish, and um, they are pretty much the gold standard. They're fast and accurate. So, and, and if your guys aren't taking care of their meters, like I mean, like they're babies, 
then don't give them the meter. Get somebody in there that is more responsible with the you know two or three thousand dollars worth of meters that you're putting into their possession. Um, th these are not tinker toys. These are highly technical laboratory grade, you know, measuring devices. Uh, now, residential. Okay, residential. Uh, yeah, you can. Uh, I like survey masters. I like uh, the protimeter products for the moisture meters. I'm just, uh, personally, that's that's my like. That's a Ken Larsonism. You don't have to get protimeter because I said so. I just find that all moisture meters suck equally, okay? They're all difficult. They're all kind of, they take knowledge to un, to interpret and understand what their the data is giving you. So you have to be an expert and read the owner's manual and understand what it can and can't do. And then learn how to um, document the, 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 the values that it is reporting, how to document that intelligently and interpret those readings. Um, all right, so as far as thermal hygrometers go, Visala is very good for even for residential as well. Not necessary, but they're ideal. They're excellent for that purpose. They're just expensive. They're about 550 bucks. And then you have, um, there, there is another, there are other thermal hygrometers that are out there. The one that I have found uh, success with over the last two years for residential, because it's a little bit faster than Visala, yet still very accurate with LGRs, is put out by a com company called, um, Luft, L is in Larry, U, F is in Frank, F is in Frank, T is in Tom. They're German and they're not easily accessible, but they're 350 bucks and they're fast and accurate. And they have both temperature and relative humidity on the same screen. And for that reason, I like that uh, device for that purpose. Uh, your guy should definitely have a laser thermometer. That's something that you point at a surface and it tells you how hot the material is. That's something that should be in your guys' kits. Uh, I can answer many questions if I have that data. If I don't have the, the, the data about how hot the materials are, I shrug my shoulders and say I can only speculate. But that, in, that material temperature is a very important bit of information, especially if you are in a cold region like Canada. That the, the the bit of data that I really want when I'm reviewing Canadian files is how hot were the materials. I don't I don't care as much about the temperature, relative humidity, or moisture meter meter reading. I want to know how hot that material is. It answers a lot of questions because it's freezing cold outside, and if the materials are cold, they're not going to dry, right? Obviously. All right. Um, what else do you need to have in there? Um, Thermal imaging camera for uh, scanning purposes. Uh, I don't. I, I don't personally see the value in having a thermal imaging camera that's five to ten thousand dollars in the hands of one of my techs. It's uh, that's overkill. I would stay. You know, I'd stay inexpensive with my thermal imaging technology with my techs. Um, you know, keep it a, a, around a thousand. Don't go more than that for thermal imaging technology. And the other question that I wanted to answer, and I just saw this in the chat, somebody said, testing with these samples for category can be done quickly and holds up to insurance scrutiny is the question. And so your IEP should show up with some ATP sampling technology that doesn't just show biological load like ATP. There are other swabs you can get that will find only coliform bacteria or only E. coli, and it gives you an instant result. Do you have any idea how much I can leverage that? Because if I can find E. coli right away within, within seven hours of the sample, now I've got instant information that is useful to the homeowner and to the uh, uh, the insurance company and the contractor. It's not, if I've got E. coli and coliforms present, it's not category one because the threshold is zero. Therefore, it's a two or a three, and this is our scope. And um, I like that question, and I wanted uh, everyone to hear that, that there is a fast way to determine category, but you need someone who has been trained on that technology of how to conduct those tests and understands how to interpret that. Okay, so. I'll leave that with the group.
Well, then real, real quick, guys, just on the equipment recommendation, uh, Joe with Rytech of Greater Calabasas just wanted to thank you for the, the Vasala, Vasala recommendation. I think he's chatted with you a little bit in the past, Ken, but, yes. but he said they're fantastic pieces of hardware and have helped him with uh, with discussions with adjusters before. So They really are. Yep. Um, any uh, preference on equipment? It sounds like some people were curious. Red brand, blue brand, does yeah. it matter to you? Look, okay. It, there have been some people in our industry that have made almost a career out of out of being a consumer's risk report on this machine is better than this machine. And I struggle with that effort. And the reason why is be, because I have a very strong opinion that it is not the doggone machine that drives the building. It's not the machine that drives the building. And I'll explain why. Okay, so it, when I'm in a classroom and I'm talking to students and I'm you know I'm doing the WRT or the ASD class or whatever, um, I described how most of us, since we have a blue collar streak, we like to be work with our tools. Most of us love our tools. Okay, we just Oh, just really get excited when we see a beautiful tool set out there. And, you know, so I like to embellish the conversation by talking about those big red toolboxes where you might have Craftsman on the front or Snap-on or some other favorite brand of tools that you have. And I ask the group, how many dollars can you spend filling that six foot tall toolbox with your favorite brand of tools? And there will be a variety of uh, responses sometimes being as high as $75,000 to fill that six foot tall red toolbox with your favorite brand of tools. So imagine you had this toolbox, you just bought it, you proudly put it in your garage, you park it right there at the wall and you bring your car in and you park it one foot from that toolbox. You then go inside your house and go to sleep for the night. When you come back in the morning, is your car fixed? Well, of course not, because it's not the $75,000 tool that fixes the car. It's the mechanic and their skill with their tools that will produce the desired results. And I'm, I, I really like to emphasize that when it comes to drying equipment. I don't care if it's stainless steel or blue or any other color on the spectrum, okay? It's not the tool that dries the structure. It is the mechanic and their skill with the tools that will produce the desired results. And so when I see insurance carriers try and argue, well, that company over there, they would have done it with less equipment in a shorter period of time. Oh, and your head explodes, right? What a stupid, stupid comment that is. Um, my response to them is, it's not the tool that dries the structure. It is the talent that the technicians bring to the job when they are engineering a drying strategy that works on the products that they are addressing. It's a very important understanding and it, it puts the attention in the right space. So to answer the question that you raised, Chris, okay, do I have any recommendations? Here's my recommendation. If you think it's sexy and you think it's reliable and it is, um, suitable for use in your country. In other words, it has underwriters laboratories marks on it, that it is CSA in Canada, CSA approved, that it is approved for use electric as an electric appliance in your country, then knock yourself out because they all blow air, dry air and heat or cool air. That They all do the same thing. It's they have different limitations and 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 um, user comforts, okay, that uh, you would, that, that's what you're ending up buying is, are those features. Um, so much good information when it comes to equipment. Um, one of the questions that we got kind of a few, I'm going to try and generalize this because we got a few and I know we're running short on time here. What would be your description of the stabilization process? We had questions like, can I put a dehumidifier when I'm stabilizing? You know, how long should this take? Stuff like that. Well, I guess what would be kind of your expert opinion on stabilizing before the drying begins? Yeah. So everybody, if you're on this call, please pay attention to this section. This is probably the, the number one um, discussion that I'm having lately with those who uh, are struggling with finding a claim settlement. And it's 
it's frequently around this discussion on stabilizing. So pay attention to what I'm about to say on this. First of all, the expression stabilization is not something I came up with. It's in the standard. Okay, They talk about the stabilization phase. And the objective of stabilization is it is not drying. Stabilization is to prevent secondary damage in unaffected materials. Now, as a reminder, secondary damage is when the humidity gets out of control. That's what secondary damage is. It's not cross-contamination by tracking it or dripping water. That's not secondary damage. Secondary damage is when the humidity gets out of control and affects unaffected materials. So there's our objective with stabilization. We want to produce a condition where the humidity does not go out of control and produce damage in unaffected materials. And that's it. It is not to dry the wet materials, period. So what do we install to control humidity? Dehumidifiers. Do we install air movers to control humidity? No. Air movers inflate humidity. It gets the evaporation process going. So we don't install air movers on stabilization. I'm going to say that a second time. If you're putting air movers on stabilization efforts, you're not going to get paid. And I'm going to be pointing it out. You shouldn't be paid for that because there is, it's not a drying strategy. Your objective is to prevent conditions that can cause secondary damage in unaffected materials. Now, as the materials dry, uh, not materials, as you, you're, you um, people are moving around in the affected area, dust can be generated. So you might want to install some dust control mechanisms. What tool do we have for that? Air filtration devices, your HEPA air scrubbers. Now, how do you prove you needed that? Please listen to how you prove you needed that. You will solve more arguments if you do this one thing. Spend the $1,700 and go out and get a laser particle counter. Um, I will, I will uh, direct you to Xtech. They have a $1,700, uh, it looks almost like a thermal hygrometer, very small, very good, effective laser particle counter, okay? And the way you use it is this way. If you find the need to stabilize the job because there's a delay, let's say there's asbestos results that you're waiting on, the adjuster says, don't you dare proceed until I confirm coverage. Or the homeowner says, I'm broke. Don't you do a thing until the insurance company says you're covered and you're going to get paid. You know, there's frequently a delay at the start of the job. So don't go into a drawing strategy because nobody's verifying that you're going to get paid yet. Okay. You wouldn't do work if you're, nobody's verified that you're going to get your paycheck. So once you have that, um, that, that done, then you, um, then uh, you, you will, you uh, you bring in the dehumidifiers. And again, what is your objective with the dehumidifiers? Don't use the IICRC dehumidifier formula for stabilization calculations. There is a copy and paste error in our current standard where it speaks about during stabilization, you reference that dehumidifier formula. It is an error. I know it's in there. If you want to try and use it, go ahead, but it's probably going to be pointed out. It's an ineffective formula for the purpose of stabilization. You might lose that argument. Nonetheless, if you have um, a stabilization strategy, here's what you do. Install enough dehumidification to keep the temperatures between 60 and 80 Fahrenheit, because those are comfortable living conditions for most people. So around 70 is, is appropriate, 20, 21 Celsius, okay? 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Then you want a relative humidity to be something that represents normal. Now, in most people's houses, according to the American Society for Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, they say that a normal humidity is not a grains per pound. A normal humidity is between 30 and 55% RH. Now, 30% is, that's ah, a pretty good drying chamber, but we're not in a drying strategy. And so they're not going to pay you for a drying strategy. So you make it a stabilization strategy, and that's 50% relative humidity. Produce a condition that is 70 Fahrenheit, 50% RH, and doesn't vary from that very far. Now, 
you know, some of you might be asking, well, why don't you use the home HVAC for that? Well, you should if it's a category one loss. But if it's a category one loss, there's usually no delays. You can get right to work. So it's usually the contaminated loss losses that have delays. So if you've got that, you know, that delay uh, for, uh, you know, uh, for before you can start drying and start doing the mitigation, then you need to put it into a stabilization strategy. So you set the parameters, 70 Fahrenheit, 50% RH, put in the dehumidifier, heaters, and air conditioners for that purpose. Then for the dust control, take your laser particle counter before you turn on your dehumidifier and you get a reading in that room and you see what your particulate counts are. Then you start putting in the, the, the dehumidifier and start turning it on, get the air moving in there and collect another reading. What do you think happens to the particulate count? It inflates. You got a big old number. So you documented the before, the after. Now you prove that there is a dust issue that you're generating and that's your equipment that's doing it. You have proved that it was the responsible thing to control the those particulate. And then you um, install a HEPA air filter and you take that laser particle counter and put it right into the outlet of the part of, of the HEPA air filter, and you take a reading from that, and you prove that. Look at all the filtering it's doing; should be darn close to zeros coming out of that filter, right? So make sure that it's working correctly. And then you said that's why I installed it because it was needed, and it proved that it provided value. So you leave it there for days and days and days until you know because the stabilization frequently takes days, and you take take a reading every day with the laser particle counter. Until you get down to that very first point where it was nice and low, you know, that first reading where you showed what normal was, right? And then you take, once it gets below that, you turn off the HEPA air filter, come back in 30 minutes and take another reading and boom, the numbers go right back up again. So you prove that you had to turn your air filter back on. My point is when it comes to having arguments of opinion, you bring the data, you, you bring facts to their opinion game. And that's how you beat that. That one job with the use of your laser particle counter, if you got paid for that, that air filter, when they uh, would normally have been able to get you to take that off the bill, if that laser particle counter got you paid in that one job, it could pay for that one laser particle counter. Please bring more comp competence to our documentation. I'm inviting you to do this. Bring more confidence to our documentation with better data. And a laser particle counter is a very important part of getting you paid on air filtration devices. Does that make sense? So once all of that is done, then you can begin the drying process, okay? Once everybody has said, okay, we're gonna pay, we know where the money's coming from and there's nothing else that can delay, you may now begin the drying. Here's the way I'd like you to do this. It was one of the questions I saw this morning when I was previewing what kind of things we were going to see today. But here's the big one. If you, um, if you are doing a stabilization strategy, you can save yourself a lot of heartache if your mitigation is broken up into two phases. Phase one is stabilization and phase two is restorative drying. So all of the costs associated with getting it ready for drying, that's one scope, one exactimate, one invoice, stabilization. Don't blend it together with drying. They have nothing to do with drying. You're going to be using dehumidifiers and air filtration devices and heaters and air conditioners for stabilization, but never an air mover. That's the stabilization effort. When you're now ready to go to the drying, <clears throat> you've taken out the affected sheetrock, you've taken out the affected insulation, take it up the affected flooring, you've washed everything, you've disinfected everything, you've sucked up all those fluids, you've tested it all to verify it's sanitary, you've uh, moved all the furniture. Think of the costs associated with that. You've done your emergency service call and they've got five, six, seven days of just waiting for it to be everybody to get on the same page so that you can begin the drying. 
make a scope for that those first five days and then close it send them the bill and now you're doing the drying well heck man if you've got exposed two by fours exposed sheet uh, uh, uh plywood uh nothing in the way everything is all sanitary there's no water to suck up everything is just you know exposed wood man you can use air movers dehumidifiers and whatever other tools you want and uh it'll only take two, three, four, five days to get that stuff done because it's all exposed. Nothing's tricky. It's all straightforward. And then you give an invoice for that. Now look at how the conversation changes. When the reviewer sees this, they see the two invoices and they sometimes are going to want to combine them and say, you did 18 days of drying. No, ma'am. I did 12 days of drying and uh, sorry, 12 days of stabilization and six days of drying. And that changes the discussion. It's not all drying. Most of it usually is stabilization efforts, just getting ready for the first day of drying. Um, and I will also say that your HVAC systems in your house, when it is contaminated, will you please not forget to isolate them? Don't you dare use HVAC systems when the house is contaminated. Category two, three losses, you can't use the HVAC system. You have to isolate it, disable it. Well, I'm in Canada, it's gonna freeze. Yeah, bring in some, sup not supplemental, portable heat, portable, don't call it supplemental. There is language in some policies that I've seen that say that they do not pay for temporary solutions. So it's not supplemental, it's not temporary. This is portable. You bring in a portable heater, a portable air conditioner. There's, I haven't seen the language that gets that dismissed. Um, and that's the way I would do it. Uh, hopefully you found some of those ideas helpful. Awesome. Um, we probably have time for one or two more questions here. Ken, I can't thank you enough. I know we've got a ton of good feedback already throughout that there's been uh, lots of helpful tips and tricks here uh, within it. The first one, uh, we, we've gotten a bunch of questions. We categorize them about mold. Question that I always get, can you clean mold? Is that possible? And what would be your recommendation uh, for the best solution to kill mold on a uh, two by four was the exact question. And the answer could be, you can't just. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. So Chris, actually you can kill mold. It, it can be done. Unfortunately, the chemical is so darn dangerous. It'll kill you too. Have you heard of agent orange before? Yeah. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff that kills everything. It's a sterilant. Um, so yeah. Look, the question is a, a common one. And um, I, I say respectfully to whoever posed that question, um, you should probably continue your studies on the subject of competent mold remediation, all right? Because at no time are efforts to kill or encapsulate uh, mold ever an adequate substitute for its physical removal. And the answer has been obvious and been taught for 30 years now. Okay, so this isn't a new idea. Look, even if you could kill it, all right, now it can't germinate. It could still have that toxin that it can sometimes produce that could, we can react to. So even though it can't germinate and grow, you can still have a health consequence if you ingest it. Okay, so that's not a cure. Killing the mold is never a cure. It doesn't solve the problem. And the other thing is this, that all mold, and that's a sweeping statement, but it's a true one, all mold is allergenic. So which means that it has the potential to be an allergen. And 20% of the Earth's population is allergic to mold. One in five people can have a reaction. So even though it can't germinate and grow, it's still an allergen. So why, would, why are we even thinking about, oh, let's try and kill the mold? your ladder is leaning against the wrong wall. That is not the objective of competent restoration. The objective of competent restoration is to remove the contaminants, the biological contaminants, and prevent the conditions that can continue its uh, growth. And that's our, uh, our objective in mold. Hopefully that was sufficient. And then the last question, we got a bunch of them for some reason um, about injection drying. Um, someone asked, is injection drying worth it? Should I keep my injection drying machine? And in what circumstances should I use an injection dryer? Yeah, listen, 
absolutely keep those valuable machines. The ticket to the hardwood floor drying party are those vacuum panels used on the uh, hardwood floors. That, that really is a spectacularly valuable tool to keep. Um, drying out wall interiors, <clears throat> yeah, that is an accessory for those. Um, I think that they need to be deployed responsibly. If it is category one, if you did get at it quickly um, it, and it hasn't changed category and there is, um, there, there is a minimal uh, concern for the risks associated with changing the air pressure inside a wall cavity, then um, I, I can see wall drying strategies being helpful. One of the other questions I saw there, can you think of any occasion when you shouldn't put a wall cavity under negative or a chamber under negative? And I thought, oh, that's a good question. I will say these two. One is when you're in a hospital. If you're in a hospital and you're starting to put one room under negative, you're changing the pressurizations in possibly critically controlled areas. Be very, very, very cautious about ever changing pressurizations in medical faci uh, facilities. Uh, there, there, you could have really serious consequences as a result of that. Um, and of course, um, pressurization when there's contaminants that or uh, that you don't want to be drawn into your chamber. There, there's you have to think before you start producing uh, chamber alterations. Um, did I answer all those questions? I, I kind of lost myself down a rabbit hole there. Oh, I think you did. That was okay. uh, Good. that was that was impressive, guys. The amount of questions that Ken was able to get through there in an hour and a half. Um, once again, I can't thank Ken enough for joining us here today. And I also can't thank um, everyone who submitted questions and attended. Um, we saw basically everyone stick on for the whole hour and a half. So if that doesn't tell you how valuable it was, I don't know what will. Um, we um, are really dedicated to continually putting these on. Ken, thank you for your support of these educational events. We put these on strictly for education in the industry, right? Which is something that I know Ken is super passionate about and I can guarantee he's gonna be back for more. Um, First off here, if you um, are looking to learn more from Ken, there's a couple ways to connect with him here, Ken at drystandard.org, as well as connect with him on LinkedIn. And then please scan that QR code. Um, you can download an order form uh, for Ken's book. Um, we got feedback from a previous one that everyone said that that book was invaluable, um, that, it was, uh, that it was useful on the next job they went out to. Um, so really, really worthwhile to go to that order form. It goes over to uh, Ken and he can uh, get the book shipped out. That sounds Perfect. good, everybody. And uh, you see my email up there. I see many questions. They were excellent questions and I would love to answer them. If I didn't answer your question, my email is ken at drystandard.org, not .com, but .org. Please send me that question in an email. I'd love to respond to your question and uh, give you the time that you deserve. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Ken. There is going to be a quick survey that pops up at the end. Uh, we do love to hear from everyone. We want to make sure they're providing more educational content. I can guarantee Ken will be back for a future webinar. Um, so uh, once again, really appreciate the time today, guys, and we will all chat soon. But thanks very much. Absolutely. And thank today. you, Encircle. You guys are doing such a good job at helping the industry stay on the cutting edge of information. I hope you do more of these. Awesome. Thank you, Ken. Great chat with you.